This is a continuation of the food fraud tabletop exercise. This is a supplemental video on industry and government activities, an update September 2016. First off, when we consider laws and regulations, an important aspect is the role of the public-private partnership and what's going on in industry. It's also important to consider what's going on around the world. So we'll look at industry standards, certification, and guidance, specifically GFSI and the SSAFE organization. To start, the Global Food Safety Initiative, GFSI, is an industry-led group that focuses on strengthening and harmonizing food safety management systems. The industry got together to look at what, was, what were the best practices, what were the laws and regulations, and to try to put together in one spot, in one kind of master idea, uh, this overall best practice. So once we have a more centralized standard method, then we can have sharing of best practices and um, benchmarking. The Safe Supply of Affordable Food Everywhere, S-Safe Group, is an industry-led group that focuses broadly on food production and food safety issues, including providing enough food for the planet. The two groups got together, and the attach, the attach summarizes the GFSI and S-Safe work related to food fraud. GFSI endorsed the S-Safe food fraud guidance, which led to a food fraud vulnerability assessment, guidance, and method. So this was a presentation from the GFSI and S-SAFE group on uh, food fraud vulnerability assessment tool, specifically the S-SAFE work. This was uh, presented at the GFSI China Focus Day in November 2015. This uh, slide deck was approved for us to uh, reuse here. First off, earlier we, we talked about the GFSI cycle. And the key here to step back is that that the, the regulations are in place because there's a concern about the supply of the food, the food chain. And there's a lot of different regulations around the world uh, and, and commercial requirements across industry. So GFSI got together and created a central guidance document. This is an overview and expectations of what is in a food safety management system. So here, the GFSI creates the idea. Next is standard organizations create the standards themselves. And there's a number of standards organizations mentioned here and every one of them seems to have an expertise in one area or another. So a company could choose which standard they use. These are all uh, identified as compliant with GFSI and approved by GFSI. The third box there is implementation and execution. Companies do it. They decide usually at the board level, CEO level, that they wanna have some controls in place. These are also things that are required to uh, conduct commerce, um, a, a supplier, or a customer may require a GFSI compliant uh, food safety management system. So companies implement the system. And then the fourth box is certification or audit. And this is where the adherence to the standard, which is, which is aligned with GFSI, is confirmed. The thing that's efficient for governments is food fraud is new and evolving. And food fraud prevention is, is also evolving. So if a government requires a process, but not a specific process step, then it reinforces and strengthens the entire system. There, there becomes more of an urgency to implementing these systems, especially to meet regulatory requirements, which may be at a higher level. So by a government requiring a process, such as a hazard assessment for all hazards and a, a prevention plan or mitigation plan for those hazards that are identified as bad, then um, that just reinforces uh, creating a system. And again, what's excellent is with more pressure on the system, then more formal, more rigorous assessments and control plans are put in place. And with a standardized system, then there can be, again, the harmonization of sharing of best practice. So GFSI uh, uh, has an idea of a food safety management system, and they call it an umbrella. And this is really like a quality management system. It's not just identifying and addressing only the worst hazards. It's identifying the root causes of what could lead to a hazard. And under the GFSI system, originally there was, there was food safety or HACCP that we're familiar with, and that's aligned with the HACCP type programs that are required um, by, by regulations. And then food defense was added as one, and food fraud was added as a third pillar. Now under food defense, GFSI requires a separate food defense only assessment. So this is similar to the US FDA requiring a separate food defense assessment. Now the GFSI, um, scope is broader than the FDA, FDA, US FDA scope on wide scale harms, but a overall GFSI assessment would include and cover the, such as the requirements under FISMA. And food fraud, GFSI requires a separate food fraud vulnerability assessment called a VASIP. So we've got HACCP, TASIP, and VASIP. So 
uh, regulations like US FDA, FSMA doesn't require a specific separate vulnerability assessment for food fraud, but it does require that all hazards are addressed. So by having three assessments here, it doesn't actually make it three times the work. It actually is, is more efficient and easier to conduct three separate assessments than trying to incorporate them together. Because the food fraud vulnerability is so much different than the other two that um, it just makes an, an, an easier system. The specific key elements for food fraud mitigation identified by GFSI are to conduct a food fraud vulnerability assessment, the details are here, and a food fraud mitigation plan with the details here as well. So this generally is consistent with ISO 31000 risk management, uh, the basic principles and practices, um, all the way through to things like, like the, uh, the preventive controls rule for, for FSMA in, in the U.S. Basically, conduct a hazard assessment and have a plan uh, to manage and mitigate the, uh, the ha bad hazards that you find. So, again, dealing with GFSI, looking at this broad scope, then that should be uh, technically meeting the requirements um, for, for something like, uh, like a regulation like FSMA. The food fraud vulnerability assessment tool was developed by us safe with others and basically they created a practical tool that helps companies undertake a vulnerability assessment and help companies prepare a plan to mitigate the identified vulnerabilities so a key here is that gfsi and s safe saw that they didn't want to just require plans then have no plans um, actually available they developed what they thought were um, key ingredients in a guidance document as well as that vulnerability assessment and they had a series of activities and workshops, cons consultations uh, that were conducted around the world to make it easy access for other people. And then they created the final draft and then published their mitigation guide. SSAFE then worked with the PwC uh, partnership to then launch this as an online tool. So it's available either an Excel spreadsheet or an online tool for automation. And that was the conclusion of the SSAFE GFSI overview of the food fraud vulnerability assessment and mitigation plans. Shifting gears a little bit to look at global activity, specifically China and Europe. So it's interesting to see what's going on around the world to see how that applies to the work uh, done such as in the US and in our food fraud tabletop exercise. First off, uh, through a number of presentations we've given and uh, joint research projects, um, there's a lot of activity that's been going on in China and we have insight on that. So there's this Chinese food safety law and in 2015, uh, members of the Chinese National Center for Food Safety Risk Assessment came to Baltimore to present um, on the food safety topic. And um, as you'll note here, the food fraud incident types are listed and those are parallel to what we've seen before. Um, and the focus they have is on the two red items, adulteration and counterfeit. One reason why they focus on those is because those are the ones that they find to be the highest health hazard and the, the highest impact. Second is when they presented the food safety, their new food safety laws. This was later uh, at the food safety summit, but then also at the, the IFT conference in 2015. You'll see that when they talked about food fraud, they talked about it in relation to other types of food risks. And you'll notice the food risk matrix there in each of the presentations. It's logical that it's there. It's cited uh, back to, to our work at Michigan State because these, these uh, uh, presenters were co-authors on uh, several papers. So we've got um, articles that have been translated and interpreted into other languages such, such as Chinese. So it's interesting to see that there is this harmonization of concepts um, around the world and specifically with China. So across Europe, there's been a number of activities. The European Commission has a food fraud network. The UK has a food crime unit and inter inter Operation Opsin has been ongoing with the Interpol and Europol. You'll notice on the right, the European Union draft report, which is now final, and then the food crime uh, overview strategy from the uh, 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 in the UK, and then the slide from Operation Opsin. So really, what we see is they've established a network and information exchange. There's a lot of information, a lot of people working on this. And the real next questions are to take this from a group of people together to really look at actions and starting to look at measuring success. So to measure success, we first have to ask the question, what is success? <laughs> But in, in identifying what is success, we also need to identify what is failure. We have to look at who does what. That's optimizing the role of the government in food fraud prevention. How much is enough? Are we making progress? Again, that's back on, based on looking at measurables. How do we know if we're making progress? 
And what we see as the real next step is what's being done with, with companies is to look at this country of product level strategy. And specifically that would start with a vulnerability assessment at even the country level. That seems like an amazing, overwhelming, too big of a concept, but we were looking at really the overall, you know, general risk principles and practices of how to in introduce those. Specifically the Elliott Review of Food Fraud in the UK. This was um, commissioned after the horse meat incident and it, it emphasized the importance of a systems approach and preventative measures, which is consistent with the EU draft resolution on food fraud, the US FDA's comments, both specifically on the global strategy and the role of FDA in, in global food safety and the USA Congressional Research Service report on food fraud. The focus was expanding the research from detection to collaborative prevention. So from reaction to more proactive action. This is consistent with many reports from around the world and from research. The report reiterates that food fraud is a unique threat that requires a specific attention. That's something we're starting to see more and more, not specifically under FISMA or in the US, but we're seeing that specifically around the world. Specific recommendation was to create a food crime unit, so a group only focused on food fraud prevention. With that, I'll say once again, um, on behalf of my colleagues, I'm Dr. John Spink, Michigan State University, Brad Deacon, Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development, and Dr. Doug Moyer from Michigan State University. Please feel free to contact us at any time. We're very interested in working with you on this topic, learning additional questions if you have, ways that we can improve this presentation. We will be updating this on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Have a great day.